Diabetes mellitus is the most common diagnosis in my practice, so I, I feel like I know it really well, and I think I've got some good information to give you, um, particularly regarding uh, diagnosis and management. So let's get underway. So I've got a uh, patient. He's uh, 60 years old. He's got hyperlipidemia and obesity. He had a recent routine lab analysis found that his serum glucose level was 146 milligrams per deciliter. Um, he's asymptomatic at this time. What's the next best step in his care? Should we talk about lifestyle changes and recheck his glucose along with a hemoglobin A1C level in the next several weeks? Should we start metformin now or a sulfonylurea or a dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor? What do you think? Given his lack of symptoms and that glucose level, we are mandated to recheck his glucose level. And I would check an A1C too, because with his risk factors, sounds like he probably has diabetes. Of course, you're gonna advise him on lifestyle changes now. And so that makes sense. He does not have meet the formal criteria for diabetes as of yet, but many people do. Um, overall, there are, there are now more than 20 million Americans with type 2 diabetes, and this number is expected to more than double um, within the next 20 years or so. So, should we be screening for diabetes? Well, this is what the United States Preventive Services Task Force, or USPSTF, says. Among adults aged 40 to 70 years, which is kind of the sweet spot for identifying diabetes, uh, check for uh, either glucose or A1C, either one's a valid measure, among patients who are obese, and among those with a family history of diabetes, high-risk racial or ethnic groups, which include Latinos and uh, African Americans, and what, if the patient has a history of gestational diabetes or polycystic ovary syndrome, those patients get screened too. Lots of people uh, meet the screening criteria. You can apply that fairly broadly uh, across a prop population. So how do we diagnose diabetes? Um, so it's a serum glucose level of 126 milligrams per deciliter or seven millimoles per liter on two separate occasions. And also glucose in the urine can be supportive as well, but I think really we use serum markers to, uh, to identify uh, diabetes. Or it could be an HbA1c of 6.5% or more on two separate occasions. But if a patient comes in with fatigue and polyuria and polydipsia, and you check their glucose in the clinic, and it's over 200 milligrams per deciliter, no further testing is necessary. They have uh, diabetes. Of course, those patients will get a baseline HbA1c level right away as well. So I think this is good for patient care and also good for what may come up on your exam. This is the routine evaluation for patients with diabetes with a schedule. So patients with type 2 diabetes get their um, an ophthalmologic exam right away uh, when they're diagnosed with a dilated pupil for a retinal exam, and then they're, that's followed at least annually. The HbA1c, if it's well controlled, can be every six months, poorly controlled every three months. A complete foot exam with monofilament testing at least every year. Lipids at least every several years, I probably draw them more often. Um, a urine microalbumin creatinine ratio at the time of diagnosis and then annually. And then blood chemistries and renal function at least every six months. All those things, fairly straightforward, make sense. Most of my patients are achieving those goals. Now, we do an HbA1c level, and it turns out it's 8.2%. So besides lifestyle intervention, what's the best treatment to prescribe for this patient now? Is it A, glipizide, B, liraglutide? Uh, C, a basal insulin at night, or D, metformin. And in previous years, you could make an argument, you know, as to which one might be better. Now it's fairly clear, and um, the American Diabetes Association recommends, uh, along with the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, metformin is a foundational drug for diabetes. So we'll talk about different interventions uh, for diabetes with medicines in a second, but you always start with lifestyle first. Because just think about it, a multidisciplinary team uh, can promote weight loss of up to 9% among patients with diabetes. And that's gonna uh, reduce the need to use anti-diabetes drugs and antihypertensive drugs as well. Physical activity is about as good as a, one of the weaker oral agents uh, for reducing HbA1c. And diet advice is similar. It can reduce uh, the HbA1c by another half to 1% for most people. 
And it probably is better when it comes from somebody with experience in counseling patients, like a dietitian or a certified diabetes educator versus a physician who's trying to manage 20 things at once. We'll look a little pearl regarding home glucose testing. Uh, we recommend this broadly and probably a little too broadly, um, just in terms of stewardship of resources, uh, because it can get expensive to get new machines, to get the lancets, uh, to get the test strips. Um, it's most helpful for patients with severe diabetes who are taking insulin. It hasn't really been shown to make much of a difference among patients who are fairly well controlled on oral medications, especially those early in their illness, and it doesn't necessarily change uh, quality of life. Where I might use it in a patient who's on oral medications alone is pa are patients with highly fluctuating glucose going very high and then at risk of hypoglycemia. But for somebody who's chugging along and taking only metformin uh, and their HbA1c is 6.8 to 6.6% 6 .6 every time I check it, you know, there's not really much of a need to do any, uh, any home glu glucose testing at all. So something to think about. Now I mentioned metformin is the first line agent. Why? Um, there's a low risk of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia and its danger has become a lot more apparent over the past few years and we'll talk about some agents that promote low sugar. It's usually associated with a very modest weight loss. It doesn't create the cycle of more weight gain, therefore more insulin resistance, and then more need for drugs. And uh, the big complication with metformin that everybody worries about is lactic acidosis, that's right. And it's more common among patients with severe uh, kidney disease uh, but now, the, the new rules uh, and warnings on the drug state that it can be used for certain patients all the way down to a glomerular filtration rate of 30 millimeters per minute. So that's kind of remarkable and a, and a big change, getting metformin to more patients who need it. Sulfonylureas have been around a long time. Like metformin, they're inexpensive. Um, and like metformin, they promote about the same degree of HbA1c reduction. If you ever get stopped and have to answer in like half a second, okay, how much does this drug reduce, uh, this oral drug reduce HbA1c? 1% is always a good answer because uh, they tend to be around that level. But the problem with sulfonylureas is, is they can promote hypoglycemia and weight gain and therefore may be less favored. There's also an, an unknown effect whether they improve mortality or not. Newer agents now, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. Um, these are, I think the benefit to these drugs is they're really well tolerated and they're fairly easy to use. Don't promote a lot of hypoglycemia, low rate of side effects overall. Um, they can even be used in moderate renal dysfunction as well. The drawback, they're not that effective. So they're good for patients who are right next to goal, maybe with metformin, but can't quite get there. Um, but they also have intolerance to multiple drugs you know, a DPP-4 inhibitor could be a good idea for them. Thiazolidinediones, um, only, only rosaglitazone is available in the United States. Um, these drugs can promote weight gain, which is partly water weight. They can promote edema. Patients with history of bladder cancer or osteoporosis should not be using these drugs. And they reduce HbA1c by about 1%. So they still have some role, uh, but it's probably a more limited secondary role in the management of most cases of type 2 diabetes. What about the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists? So these are different drugs. These are, again, even a newer wave. They've been out for several years now, so it's important for us to know them. Uh, different uh, dosing schedules, but they are not, there's no oral product out there right now. Um, they're subcutaneous injections. Um, they rarely are associated with pancreatitis, and you can't use them among patients with the most severe uh, chronic kidney disease, but they can be used in moderate uh, kidney disease. The beneficial effects of GLP-1 agonists, uh, they can promote weight loss. Uh, sometimes it exceeds six or seven kilograms. Um, it, routinely, it's gonna be at least four kilograms, so weight loss is important and something that patients can really hold on to. It's not easy to lose four kilograms of body weight for many patients. And their HbA1c action is a little bit stronger than other oral agents. So between the fact that it promotes weight loss and it reduces A1C fairly robustly, um, I like GLP-1 agonists. Another new kit on the block, the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitors. These inhibit glucose reuptake. They work in the kidneys. Um, they have been associated with a higher risk for UTI as well as genital fungal infections. 
These also promote weight loss, though, as well as they lower blood pressure in of themselves, too. Again, a little bit weaker, though, for uh, their HbA1c reduction. So not, not, something, not that strong re reduction you might experience with a GLP-1 um, agonist. Say the patient's not doing that well and continues to maintain a high A1c despite your best medical therapy. So patients who come in with an HbA1c above 9 can be considered for insulin. In my practical experience, most, most clinicians aren't thinking about using insulin right off the bat unless they come in with an A1c of 11 or more. But one thing that's certainly true is patients who are failing badly and taking two oral um, anti-diabetes drugs, there's not much point in putting them on a third oral uh, diabetes, anti-diabetes drug. At that point, it's time to reconsider uh, therapy and include insulin in that regimen. The problem with insulin is there's just a lot of variability. Um, how often the patient uses it, their diet, how used they are to checking their home glucose, how involved their health literacy, all these things uh, factor in the efficacy of insulin. It's, it's frankly probably easier to take a pill. Uh, but you can start with something basic like augmentation of their usual therapy with basal insulin. There's the dose, 0.3 units uh, per kilogram per day. Uh, that's, this is really where you want it. If you haven't initiated doing home glucose monitoring, you're going to want to initiate home glucose monitoring and tell it, warning the patient about hypoglycemic symptoms and how to react because, of course, that's one of the downsides of insulin treatment. It is a nice opportunity, in my opinion, to check on lifestyle because you can follow along and you notice when, they go, when the patient goes high with their uh, glucose readings at home and when they go low and what, what happens. Oh, that's the day I exercised. That's the day I forgot to eat. Or when it's high, oh, that was a big party I went to and I kind of went nuts and ate whatever I wanted and that's when my glucose was 450. So it can give you some insights into how to counsel patients about, you know, because lifestyle never leaves. Just because the patient goes through diabetes education classes and meets with an, edu uh, an educator or a promotora or whatever, it's, you know, it's never quite over. You have to keep up that lifestyle. And uh, importantly, once you initiate insulin treatment, don't let go of metformin, foundational drug, and uh, can help mitigate against the weight gain you're going to experience with insulin. But sulfonylureas, once you start a prandial insulin, there's not much point in using sulfonylureas anymore. Get them off because they might promote hypoglycemia and weight gain. And hypoglycemia is a serious risk, so really monitor it closely. Keep these levels in mind, goal glucose levels for fasting patients, uh, 90 to 130 milligrams per deciliter. For postprandial, less than 180 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm happy to, that, that, to give you that overview on uh, diabetes care. I think the keys are get the diagnosis right and usually requires a couple of readings to do so. Um, also, never forget lifestyle and try to keep the patient on metformin as much as possible because it really is a game changer of a drug and can take time to, to work its uh, effects. Uh, make sure they get their screening on a routine basis for their eyes and for their feet, as well as for kidney disease with the microalbumin creatinine ratio. And you should, should have some very satisfied and healthy patients. Thanks. Mm -hmm.